All right. Well, here we are, the first episode of the uh, new podcast on the Gregorian Chant Academy, which I think we're just continuing to call the Chant School Podcast. Is that right? Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Right? Yeah. Great. Previously, Chant Cool Spod Podcast hosted on Floriani and... Now that Gregorian Chant Academy and Floriani have merged and we are one entity now, two divisions, uh, we're going to pick up and continue the Chant School podcast, but now as a video podcast and I think hosted here on the Chant Academy channel. So, uh, yeah, uh, Giorgio, for those of you who don't know, Giorgio Navarini is the Founder and director of Floriani. What are we talking about today, Chris? Well, we're down here in Phoenix, right? Uh, you guys are based here in Phoenix, and uh, I live in Idaho. But um, I founded Gregorian Chant Academy. You founded Floriani, and we have kind of a history, don't we? We do. Um, our families go way back. Um, before even I was born, I yeah. heard about the Jaspers. Um, we were both raised in Sacramento. Yeah. Um, I grew up on a ranch there. You grew up in, in town. Okay. Yeah. Um, I actually, I didn't even know you till high school. Yeah. And we did a few gig, chant gigs together up in San Jose. Five yeah. wounds. Five wounds. Yeah. And then you came uh, occasionally and sang at St. Stephen's. That's right. Yeah. With Jeffrey Morse, the famous Jeffrey. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we, we started Floriani. I had known... Uh, from a distance that you were doing something with the uh, Gregorian Chant Academy, uh, releasing some YouTube hits uh, with the the rip, as I call them. Yeah, uh, rip. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I remember uh, when you moved up and Ryan Morgan moved up and he was like, hey, remember Giorgio Navarini? I was like, yeah, he's like, oh, he's, he's in Kalispell now. I'm like, what? <laughs> really? That's right. Well, uh, during the, the COVID, uh, the beginning of COVID, uh, I moved, I moved, I lost my job in California. So I decided uh, to, to take a, uh, this music director men's ministry job in St. Matthews in Kalispell. And, uh, so I started a parish music program from scratch, uh, got a lot of experience on really the, the interesting dynamic of parishes and their pastors and their music programs. Um, there's a lot of sensitivity you know, sensitive sensitivity at play, especially when you're trying to bring uh, traditional, real sa Catholic sacred music to the the foreground of the liturgy. So I learned a lot doing that. Uh, and then uh, in the meantime, our pastor in in Kalispell was leaving, and I thought that was a a fair departure time for me as well. I was talking to f classmates who were friends of mine from TAC and. I presented this idea of starting the Floriani as a sacred music teaching and performing ensemble. And so our first, our first real, uh, gig and job was here in, here in Phoenix, uh, the parish of St. Anne's took us on and they covered half our fundraising need. And in turn, we built up their choirs and their music program, which, so you didn't start Floriani in Kalispell. You started it down here. I was living in Kalispell. Um, the Floriani not not for profit five one three C was started while I was living in Kalispell. We had actually been started uh, around six years prior when I was a student at Thomas Aquinas College. We just we were a group of guys who liked making music, so we we did barbershop, and then we started singing for liturgies. And then a uh, little before you know it, we we were just a full time sacred music ensemble. Because they didn't really, they didn't have a kind of classical uh, liturgical music at TAC at the time, or yeah, they do. They did. Um, they didn't quite have the chant uh, chant program that I was looking for. And um, currently, their their choir is led by Dan Graham, who is involved in more of the classical aspect of training. So they do a lot of Mozart. Um, they do a lot of Mozart, and you know these other classical composers that involve or orchestras. And I was more interested in the chance polyphony side of things. So what's the mission and vision of Floriani? As young adults, we've, we've been born into a culture that's bereft of really any identity. And we've especially been bereft of any, any musical identity. 
And so our, our really our only source of music is through pop culture um, and through the pop music that we, we receive on the radio. What we don't know is that we come from a huge and really rich heritage of and patrimony of sacred music. And really all of Western music is based in sacred music. So if you're wondering why you're listening to pop nowadays, you have Gregorian chant to thank for that. If you're wondering why you're listening to jazz or rock and roll, you have Gregorian chant to thank for that because Gregorian chant gave the the foundations of um, all Western harmonics uh, and Western rhythms. We, um, our mission in Floriani is to restore this great heritage and patrimony back to our culture. And we, we see, we see that this mission is taking out many birds with one stone. Uh, namely, uh, politics is downstream from culture. And so if we can change the culture in this small aspect, the small aspect is actually much bigger than we might think. And that'll forever change the generations that we are, we are now a part of and the future generations. And so what, what are some of the things that Floriani is working on? Like what are some of the projects uh, that we see coming down the road? Our biggest, uh, our big projects are um, through the Gregorian Chan Academy. We want to release a really uh, the high the, uh, course content of the highest quality um, online. So that it's accessible by anyone from any uh, level anywhere. And this will, this will further aid, parishes and getting great sacred music ensembles and uh, programs off the ground. Um, uh, uh, another thing we're, we're working on is uh, developing a, a sacred music conference for young adults to come and learn how to become great music directors and leaders for this next coming musical renaissance of the church. An in-person collegian. This will be in-person, and we're deciding the location. Um, spoiler alert, it might be Rome, Italy. Hopefully, possibly. Hopefully, yeah. Um, so and when um, when you are singing polyphonic works, what do you t- what, what is your typical range that you sing? I'm a, I'm a what's known as a baritone, which is a mix of baritone and tenor. Um, I can go up to an F uh, tenor F pretty um, pretty comfortably, and down to a bass F as well, pretty comfortably. And as far as uh, singing influences, who would you say has uh, been an influence? Sorry, someone told me once I sound like Josh Groban. <laughs> um, and uh, I would you know, say you're. I guess it's a compliment. Would you say are you influenced at all by Marcel Perez? I, I really like uh, what Mar- Marcel Perez is doing. I really like the group Jericho in oh, Poland. Jer- yeah. um, they're uh, they're a similar group to us because yeah. they're they're Catholic at the core. Um, they're friends of Marcel Perez and work with them. So. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're, uh, they're really, they have a spectacular sound. Yeah. Um, and they're just really an amateur group of guys. Yeah. And sometimes that p- produces a really unique sound that, um, that you can't get with, uh, professionals of the highest caliber. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so you're currently 29, 29 and you'll turn 30 in February. That's classified. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, in February 2024. Um, okay, and I'm currently 36. I'll be 37 in two months. No, month and a half. October, wow. October, which makes me the oldest member of the group now. <laughs> Great grandpa, and the sh- and the shortest. <laughs> <laughs> we have a little joke in Floriani. Uh, Graham was previously our oldest member, so we we called him Grandpa. But now uh, Chris is part of the group, so we. He's a known as great Great grandpa (laughs) or shorty shorty. All right. So, yeah, I mean, as far as our history goes, like, I don't remember, I don't remember ever meeting your family because I was so little. I think you, yeah, you might not have been even born yet. Uh, but, uh, I remember growing up that we didn't like hang out all the time, but I remember being mostly friends with your older brothers, uh, Mike, Pete, and um yeah so we, we I, I got to hear about stories about oh the jaspers and john burns you know that whole yeah whole crowd um but yeah but, uh yeah and then I, yeah when we started singing in five wounds and then coming to saint stephen's and right. that's kind of when uh uh when, when was that by the way yeah i was uh i was 15 about 15 years old yeah um actually my first exposure to saint stephen's was um 
singing for one of the, the Burns wedding, but going to the Camp Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Camp Sacred Heart alumni, shout out to you. Uh, but that was the first place I really experienced intense chant and polyphony. And it was actually at an all boys summer camp where we would wake up at 6 a.m. to practice the propers. And these yeah. are just high school boys self-led. Uh, we didn't have a priest or anyone above us telling us, oh, this is what you need to do. It was just a group of boys who were really proactive about uh, the liturgy, and we really we made it work. This That's about a summer the camp. fraternities summer camp. Fraternity St. Yeah. Peter summer camp. So what's your, your musical background? Like, how did you get into this? What was it growing up and, and, and then more professionally developed? When I, when I was seven years old, my, uh, my parents signed me up for piano lessons. And uh, I got, got really interested in that. I had a very strict Russian teacher. Her name was Natalia. Shout out <laughs> to Natalia. And um, I took that for about 12 years. But when I was 15... Um, we, our parents started going to the Latin mass, which was at the, uh, St. Margaret Mary's parish in Oakland. Oh, yeah. And, and, um, uh, the other, the other thing that, uh, that sideline happened on the sidelines was my parents decided to force me into a, uh, youth school. Um, I didn't like the idea at first, but it's within the first 15 seconds of singing with this group, I was completely and utterly changed and I've been utterly changed to this day uh, by the beauty and power of sacred music um, so what was that the a youth scholo who who was that put on by you know it was a, a little homeschool group okay um, <laughs> it was called choir of the Angelus and this was this was so long ago uh, and we had we went through a few different directors but uh, we just sang such incredible music as a as a young group uh, and it was all in the context of the liturgy but uh then how did your musical education develop from there and because you, you you even got into composition and directing and whatnot and right um a lot of it was just uh really uh i felt really passionate about it and so i decided to go down those avenues and uh just start self-developing so I had a few different people who passed through my uh, passed in my life and would give me some coaching tips, uh, whether it was composition or singing or directing. Um, uh, there was a lot of reading going on, so I read um, a lot of the the great texts on music, um, and and really it was a lot of hands on experience that got me uh, growing growing and developing in the in the field. Did you ever, now I know you came and sang with us at St. Stephen's occasionally, but was there uh, any other parish that you would sing at normally? Yeah, mainly uh, St. Margaret Mary's in Oakland. Newark. And then when the Latin Mass began in San Jose, which is actually where we first sang, um, I, I I took on a little side organ and Scola member uh, gig there. Did you ever take any um, music uh, classes at like a junior college or anything like that? Yeah. Um, uh, just, just choir classes. And, uh, I sang with a few different choirs. Um, one of them was the Santa Barbara Chorale. They were, uh, that was a really great challenge for me. But aside from that, really just in the, in the liturgy. So then when did you go to TAC? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> And what, Actually, what, what was the draw? One, before I got to TAC, uh, my senior year of high school, I actually got a phone call from the Norbertine Fathers at St. Michael's Abbey in Southern California. And um, they had a deficit of seniors that current year, which was 2011 to 2012. And they asked me if I'd like to join their senior class, which is it's not a very common thing. But um, so I decided, what the heck, this is my senior year. Um it's in Southern California, 20 minutes from the beach. Like, hey, will you come take your senior year of high school with us? Exactly. Interesting. Uh, and that's really where I was introduced some, to some of the most fantastic chant in the United States. Um, well, real quick, what was your connection with the Norbertines? How was it that they knew you and reached out to you? So, as you know, my older brother, Mike, he went to uh, went to the Abbey for, uh, for a couple years, 10 years earlier. And so we always kept connected to the Norbertines. Um, 
And so when, when they actually came, uh, I met one of the the priests uh, in San Jose at the Latin Mass, and he he asked if I'd be interested in attending their school. And uh, I was going to public school at the time and uh, not really digging it. And so, anyhow. So then you went, you finished your high school there. And then what took you to TAC? One of my spiritual director at the, the Abbey was Father Sebastian Walsh. And he is a TAC fanatic. <laughs> and my my first experience at TAC was really... Um, it was, I thought it was a little too uh, narrow of an education. Um, and then that same summer, I went to the summer program and was really introduced to the beauty behind liberal arts education, great books education. And uh, so I decided uh, I'm going to take a year off, take a gap year, and, and then I'm going to attend TAC. And that's where you started doing barbershop quartet. Right. And yes. Then, which then, because because you guys were doing that so well, one of the priests then approached you and said, "Hey, would you be interested in doing sacred music here for the? Is that basically exactly? Um, and um, so we the step by step getting involved in the liturgy. Um, it just it got to uh, we 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 decided we decided that wasn't the avenue that took more importance rather than barbershop. We still did some barbershop yeah. for fun. Um, but eventually, uh, after I graduated, we decided to take a pilgrimage to Rome. And so we sang for, um, a liturgy at the Vatican. We sang for a liturgy by Colonel oh, yeah, I've seen those videos. Yeah. So that was, that was a, a highlight of my career, our career. I seem to remember also, wasn't there, a a time, one of the years there, like around Christmas or something, you organized a flash mob. Uh, yeah. in one of the malls or something like that. <laughs> That's right. It's uh, It's got a couple hundred thousand views on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so we, that was just a little kind of, it was, it was the thing at the time. Like, yeah, uh, all these YouTube videos are coming out of flash mobs. Yeah. And uh, I figured that the entire school at TAC, every, pretty much everyone sings. And I was like, well, let's get a little group together. We'll throw on a few jigs and go sing at the, the mall. So when did you graduate TAC and what happened after that? I graduated 2017. Um, afterwards, I took a position at a classical school in Santa Barbara and I taught there for two years. Um, and then um, and then COVID happened. Uh, and that brought you up to Kalispell. That brought me up to Montana. And then after Montana, we came down to Phoenix to get this this project off the ground. Right. And you said that you, you, you went up to Kalispell because I'm forgetting now there was a, uh, invitation or. Yeah. So we had been invited, uh, just a couple of us to go do a, a parish mission for Advent and it was 20, 2018, 2019. And, um, I had still had been connected with the pastor there and he was, it was really on his heart to get a music program off the ground. And so at the start of COVID, he was like, this is kind of a ripe time because all of their programs had suspended. Mm -hmm. And, and so he invited me up there to, um, really to just get something off the ground. St. Matthews. At St. Matthews in downtown Kalispell. I remember my wife and I, the year we got married, we got married in January. So it wasn't really the right weather for a, a nice honeymoon, but that June or July, um, we took a trip out to Kalispell and to go to the, uh, um, the national park there, Glacier National Park. You guys and went to Glacier in January for your honeymoon. No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we were married in January. Okay. So right. then in June, uh, the end of June, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was Fourth of July weekend. That's what it was. We went out there and uh, went to the Glacier National Park, and uh, and then mass um, on uh, Sunday mass at St. Matthew's. Let me turn awesome. my phone off here. Uh, oh, that's a- I was gonna say, that, would be- that was 2017, no, 2016. And uh, yeah, so that was a few years before you came up there. But uh, we have our connections there with the people we know that uh, the, right. um, the Dalmatas, Dalmata. okay. which I've known since 2002. Uh, I have a long history. Sure. I've only known to the Dalmatas. So, yeah, Tyler. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, I've only known them for three years, but they're great 
but the history of Floriani, like when you're at TAC, your group was called Floriani, right? Right. So there's an interesting story behind that name, Floriani. Uh, can you tell that story? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I was uh, confirmed with the name St. Florian, and I was 15 or 16. And um, yeah, I, I, the reason I chose St. Florian as my patron was I just thought he was a cool Roman martyr. It was literally, literally the only reason. Um, and um, fast forward around eight years, I'm, uh, I just graduated college. I was working at a summer camp in Northern California. And on one of our Saturdays off, uh, I went swimming in the Yuba River uh, right outside our, the summer camp area. And um, the Yuba is a re- known as to be a really beautiful blue-colored uh, blue uh, river. And it's a fantastic, fantastic to swim in, but it's also notoriously dangerous. And what year is this? How old are you? I was, it was uh, 2017. Yeah. Okay. And June of 2017. And so I'm swimming in the river, and um, it, it, the river is enclosed by – there's pools that are enclosed by rocks in the river. And then in the center of the river, you have – uh, these stage four, uh, stage four, stage five, uh, rapids, class four, class five rapids. And, um, so I, as I'm swimming in this little enclosed pocket, there's a lot of water flowing in. I, I didn't know where it was flowing out of. And so I, I take off my St. Florian medal and I jump in the water and, um, I decide to swim to the bottom and to figure out where this water is going. Just, just to, <laughs> yeah, not to figure that out, but, uh, I just, you know, you're when you're swimming, you're like, oh, I'll go touch the bottom. I get around uh, ten or seven to ten feet down, and um, I'm like, well, I need to catch my breath, so I start swimming up to the surface. And as I'm looking up to the surface, I um, I'm pushing myself up, and I'm only going down. And you can imagine just the utter terror in my body while I'm looking up, and trying to get to the surface to get a breath of air and all I am is just sinking and immediately I realized there was something very wrong and uh, my whole body began to go into shock and I gave one last attempt to swim up but then my body completely relaxed and um, I thought my last three thoughts um, and (laughs) as I uh, told the story a couple times now um my first thought was I'm going to get sucked to the bottom of this, this whirlpool and I'm going to get stuck in between two rocks and I'm going to drown to death. And the second thing I thought was, God, why would you give me this kind of death? (laughs) Why wouldn't you have given me a martyr's death? And, uh, the third and last thought (laughs) was, uh, my parents are going to kill me. (laughs) (laughs) My parents are going to kill me for dying. (laughs) (laughs) And um, just within a few moments, this all must have been taking place around under 20 seconds, but it felt like a couple minutes. Oh, yeah. Um, So I I get sucked into this tunnel of rocks, and I'm just like covering my head to make sure I don't smash my skull in. And uh, I'm clearly going through, so... Uh, that was good news, but the bad news is I was going out into the middle of the rapids, and um, finally it shoots me straight up into the the, the surface of the, of the rapids, and I'm finally I'm able to catch my breath. It's shooting me down the river at uh, 25 feet a second. I don't know, incredible speed, and I'm going in and out of the water. I'm barely able to keep my head afloat, and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs for help. And on the shoreline, I see a father and his two sons just um, crossing over rocks and running down the shoreline to just see if they can help me. And they weren't they weren't about to get in the water for obvious reasons. Um, but they start yelling at me to swim to them, and so I just start swimming at a right angle to the flow of the water, and and it got me at a diagonal uh, down the river, and I finally got ashore. Um, and I was just, my body was in complete shock. And uh, I, I think I knelt down. 
And I just kept making the sign of the cross over and over and over. And a few people surrounded me to see if I was okay. And I was just, I don't know what to say. But in the, in, in the midst of all this, I just had this really strong um, sense. I need, to, I need to thank St. Florian. I need to thank St. Florian. And it was very odd because I was like, when do you get, when do you get such a, like a prompting to, to do something like that? And even though he was your confirmation saint, you didn't have any really particular strong devotion to him or anything? No strong devotion. Uh, he's the painter saint of firemen, which I, I, when I was 14, I think I wanted to be a fireman. And um, anyhow, I had, his, I had his, the St. Florian cross on before I went in the water. When I got out, um, I was like, I need to thank St. Florian. And um, anyhow, I, I thanked him according to the prompting at the time. But then I looked more into his life, and I realized he's not only the patron saint of firefighters, he's also the patron saint of drowning victims. And he himself was martyred uh, in a river. That's, that's awesome. And so... Uh, I mean, not awesome that yeah, I Not awesome that I almost died. Yeah. <laughs> uh, someone told me later on that, uh, you don't choose your confirmation saint, they choose you. Yeah. That might be a cl- cliche, but for me it worked out. Um, and so later on when I was when I was directing this group, I asked them, what do you guys think of calling the group Floriani? Um, and everyone liked the name, everyone liked the patron, and so we named our group Floriani. And it happened that after we started our group as a nonprofit, um, our very first gig was singing for the dedication mass of the new St. Michael's Abbey. Yeah, this is, is this is really interesting. Which is a huge, uh, which is a huge event for uh, any like you don't see a new abbey opening up every right. day. And um, they they had asked um, a few prelates to be there, and uh, apparently the only date that they could get to work for all of them uh, was May fourth. Now, you may think May the fourth be with you. <laughs> Um, and that's a, that's a very special date to, to us because it's actually St. Florian's feast day. Um, but now they didn't know that they your didn't know group that. was called Floriani. Right? They did not. Yeah. And they so, just knew you were a music ensemble and wanted you to come sing, but they didn't know your group's name. Correct. And so we, uh, the night before we got to actually venerate the, the, uh, the relic of St. Florian and, uh, which is now reposed in the altar at St. Michael's, uh, Abbey. Uh, but that, now there was also something to do with the fires around there, right? Yeah. So uh, um, that very same year after I graduated, <laughs> I was uh, living close to Thomas Aquinas College, and um, it was must have been December eighth or December seventh. Um, my dates might be totally off, but uh, that um, one night I'm, I'm in my I'm in my little uh, my little shack, and my landlady comes up and knocks on my door. She says. Um, there might be a small fire in the hills. <laughs> and I come outside and I look at uh, the mountains behind my house and there is a blazing firestorm um, across the mountain range. And my house was only 15 minutes to TAC at the time. And so I immediately thought, well, I should book it up there to go and like save students or you know help, help out whatever way I can. And so... Um, Here's my house, here's TAC, and the fire's right in between the two. And so as I'm booking it up there, um, I just see the fire raging across. There was around 40 mile an hour winds that night. And so I'm just looking at this incredible sight uh, across the uh, Santa Ana Mountains. And uh, eventually I got to the college, was able to take a few students. Um, The college itself was uh, pretty much completely unharmed from the Thomas fire, but the Thomas fire was, uh, the biggest fire in California history until the Cedar fire a few years later, over 200,000 acres were burned. So another aspect in which St. Florian, uh, has had a role in my life. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty incredible. Um, aside from history, personal history now, who would you say is like, um, um, some of your biggest musical influences, biggest musical influences. Um, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Serge, Serge Rachmaninoff. Mm. Um, I love almost everything you've re- he's re- written. Um, 
but especially his two piano concertos, piano number concerto number two and number three. Uh, they're just the most marvelous pieces of music I've ever he wrote heard. Wrote a lot of that beautiful Russian chant stuff too, didn't he? He did. Yeah, his yeah. his All Night Vespers is a. Uh, that's where we get the Bogorodizia Dievo. Yeah. Um, and bo- every almost anything he touches has turned to gold. Yeah, I remember growing up, we had the the three Sacred Treasures albums. Yeah, uh, oh yeah. And a lot of that stuff is Rachmaninoff is just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, he's just he's a uh, he's a composer of our lifetime, and um, I think yeah, he's maybe one of the greatest, maybe who, the greatest. But yeah. I'm not gonna <laughs> who else step on any toes right now. Um, aside from Sergey. Um, Obviously, Palestrina, Victoria, and uh, I mean the chants themselves have have done a, a real number on forming my musical identity. Um, I th- I heard when I was fifteen that Gregorian chant is the purest form of music, and I didn't really understand that claim until my senior thesis in college, where I studied the works of Mokoro and Dom Gajard, who are the the Salem. Um, scholars on chant and the way they d- uh, understood music and the philosophical uh, aspects of music I think were indispensable with my own understanding of uh, coming to my own understanding of what music is mm-hmm. um, particularly rhythm and its connection yeah. to uh, to melody but now despite that <clears throat> you're not necessarily a uh, glued to the Solem method, right? You yeah. So we we um, we study a lot of semiology. Uh, I really like the Solem method. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's the most interpretive way of singing the chant. I know it gets a lot of flack. Mm-hmm. Um, that might be unjustified. Um, you're a Solem guy, though, so you, you well, not necessarily. I'm not. I wouldn't consider myself uh, one or the other. I I've studied thoroughly the the Solem method. I've read when I study I like I like to go to the sources so if I'm going to study Solemn method I want to see what Makro himself wrote mm. and of course his predecessor Potier and his successor Gujard uh, Potier, obvi- Potier obviously had a different theory but um, I think it's Im- important to understand where Makro is coming from yeah. have you done a and, podcast on that the difference between um, I did a brief one like just a brief uh, comparison between Solemn method and semiology okay. just something very brief but um, so I, I've read Mokro's, uh, Le Nombre Musical Gorian and Gajard's writings. And, uh, um, I, I like a lot of what they say. I don't necessarily agree with everything. Um, and same thing with semiology. I've studied that for a long time. Uh, uh Gajard's writings. I thought I turned that off. Gajard's writing, uh, sorry, Cardine's writings, as well as his successors, Luigi Agostoni, John Berkman Gershel, and uh, Alberto Turco, who now I'm uh, acquaintance with. Um, and I like a lot of what they teach, but not necessarily everything. So I kind of try to marry the two together as much mm. as is possible. That's probably the healthiest relationship to to take to chance. Um <laughs> I know we, we read, you know, from the writings of St. Pius X that he thinks the Salem is the best, best method. Um, and that may have trickled down to a lot of mm-hmm. um, Salemniites today. Um, yeah. And who but knows? That, yeah, that's an interesting, interesting point you, you bring up there because, you know, some people will say, well, you know, uh, he didn't approve of the Salem method. He approved of Poitiers, you know, the, the Vatican edition. And, mm-hmm. uh, and it's like, well, yes, he, he put his official public rubber stamp of approval on it, but personally, he was a big fan of the Solemn method mm-hmm. and highly praised it. Because, you know, even if you can you can argue that, you know, the Solemn method, oh, it's, you know, not historically accurate, whatever, um, that may be the case in some regards, but it has a lot of very practical benefits, especially the, the more singers you have, the larger the ensemble, um, it, it becomes very practical. Right, um, yeah, you're not dealing with... Uh- yeah, people who've listened to like ensemble organum or um, various various interpretations of old old uh, old chants, you you get a lot of uh, yeah, flux between the different ways of singing, mm-hmm. uh, especially the rhythms. Yeah, um, and that's where Salem really comes in and says, "Well, just do it like this, and yeah. do that across the board, 
Um, yeah. It's a, it's a unifying and, method. And because it has a, a certain uh, set of rules uh, that are flexible, but uh, it then also helps with the catholicity of mm. the music too. Because that's something we realize, you know, one of the benefits of the, of the traditional rite is that no matter where you go in the world, the liturgy is going to be the same. You can go halfway across the world and go to a mass, and you're going to feel at home. I think, and the same thing, you know, if if you're singing with the solemn method, whatever its faults may be, uh, one of the benefits is that you could be singing it in your home parish, travel halfway around the world, and they could be using that same method, and you'll be able to sing with them quite well. You right, know, right. Uh, there's still there's still uh, you know flexibility there to allow for personal interpretation and whatnot, but it's not going to yeah. be hugely different. Yeah, if if anything, you may just say everybody should be every, every chant school should have familiarity with the Salem method, so that when you know different singers come c- uh, come in their midst, they're able to to adapt accordingly. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, it's also I think it's also just good to understand it just from an historical point of view to understand mm-hmm. the development of the history of Gregorian chant. Even mm-hmm. just from that aspect alone, it's good to, to right, to right, see. and yeah. because it's had such a huge influence, yeah. you know, in our, in our days. So in Floriani, we're getting a little more involved, uh, applying the semiological uh, mm. markings of Leon into the into the chant. And to be honest, they're not. <laughs> you 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 might uh, get triggered from this, but they're not super substantial. I'm oh, yeah. probably triggered half your audience right now. <laughs> <laughs> the ones who know the, the semiological markings. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But they just they show you different ways you can actually interpret the chants. You can hold this note longer. You could sing through this a little quicker. Um, they're, and- they're, they're nuances. You know, that's the thing with semiology is is there's a wide variety of different interpretations. Some may use semiology in a very subtle way, and others can use it in a very drastic way. And there's there's just such a broad spectrum of interpretation when it comes to semiology, <clears throat> which has its benefits. But um, one thing that Cardine himself, you know, basically the father of semiology, what he himself said was uh, in his final will and testament was like, basically, how should we use semiology? He, he asked the question, then basically answered, uh, not, I'm not saying for verbatim here, but um, he, he basically says, with subtlety and nuance. Hmm. You know, that's, you know, that, that was his, this his view is using semiology with subtlety and nuance. And even Dom Saulnier uh, said the same thing. He's like, you know, when you, you should, st- when you're learning a piece of chant, you should analyze it, analyze the text, analyze the melody, the modal structure, all this and that. And then at the end, then you can look at the semiology and see, see what you can draw from that. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's basically nuances. Yeah, I think. Uh, maybe maybe to even add to that is the really the guiding principle you want in chant is to make it beautiful, um, and artistic subtleties can if so long as they help with with making it beautiful you should follow them. Mm-hmm. If they're making it just interesting and artistic, you may want to drop them. Um, yeah, <laughs> and um, yeah. So like what we were talking about earlier, seeing whether or not. Um, you want to sing, you want to repercuss the punctums mm-hmm. every time. So just, I don't know if our, we should give an example to our listeners. Sure. Yeah. Um, you have sometimes se- several notes in a row on the same pitch on a single syllable. Right. So you'll have like, <laughs> many choirs will repercuss each note um, because you have like sometimes up to nine, nine yeah. uh, single notes in a row. Um I'm of the opinion that you should not repercuss the notes. Um, which now, I'm, from what? From an aesthetic point of view? From or? an aesthetic point of view, I just uh, chant is already such a strange animal, and to repercussing the punctums can make it sound even stranger mm-hmm. to an audience that that's already somewhat unfamiliar with it. Yeah. Um, and what I found in the Salem method, you uh, you don't repercuss all the notes. You'll um, you'll hold them. And group them into right. longer. Your aim is to make really make yeah. beautiful notes. Um, yeah. And you know, uh, some of you may be familiar with Arvo Pera, who said that um, Arvo part. Uh, his his line was to make a all you need to make beautiful music is one note sung or played beautifully. And I think you can apply that principle here by lengthening a note um, 
and giving it energy or giving it um, just substance mm-hmm. um, instead of repercussing it. Yeah. The, but, I only, I've only heard uh, that type of chant once in my life, and it was actually uh, by a, collegi- a, a collegiate group in Rome. And I was I was kind of shocked by it just to hear uh, it. You actually heard it somewhere else, too. Did I? Was it at St. Stephen? St. Stephen. Oh, yeah. maybe. They did it mu- probably a little more tastefully, and so I didn't yeah. notice. Um, yeah, we, we it wasn't very – it was more subtle the way we did it there. Hmm. Um <clears throat> But yeah, we were talking earlier about, you know, the Solem, Solem, most people don't really study the Solemn method. They learn some of the basic principles and whatnot, but they don't really study it in depth, which leads to a lot of misconceptions, both from those who like it and those who don't like it. Hmm. One of those being about the repercussions. Hmm. Most people will say, oh, well, in the Solem method, you don't you do repercussions. You group the notes, you know. It's like, well, actually... If you read Makaro's writings, he says, uh, and citing medieval sources, that yes, he says it's basically for him it comes down to a, a prudent, uh, a prudential, practical choice. He says most choirs aren't capable of doing it well, mm. and in that case, if they can't do it well, they probably shouldn't, and you should group them together in, into uh, sustained notes instead. But if they can do it well. Then I think they really should. That's yeah. You know, so that that's Makaro's. I, I, I have yet to hear it done well. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. If I do it, I try to do it very subtly because I think the way most the most of the time it's done, it's it sounds it's a little hooty, hooty. If that it the, sounds, I don't know. Just to me, it just sounds mechanical and and yeah. Um, that, dot, 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 right. You know. That's the way. That's what the only yeah. way I've heard it done. Yeah. Um, so anyway, then uh, you started Floriani in two thousand one, right? Uh, two thousand one. Uh, I would have been seven then. Two thousand twenty one. Two thousand twenty one. Excuse me. <laughs> Correct. Uh, I was twenty seven then. Yeah. Uh, yes. And, and so that was the same year that I started my academy. Okay. Um, Wow. I, I really what month did you start? Did it, it was, uh, we had our, I think our official papers for the nonprofit status came in on May 4th. Okay. So pretty close. I think I, I, I launched this in, in January of 21 and then Floriani in May is pretty, pretty darn close. Same time, time frame. But then ever since then, I've just been working entirely on my own trying to do everything. And then at the beginning of this year, 2023, uh, I realized, man, I, I really need to get a team together. Uh, I can't keep doing this by myself. It's, it's just, it's inefficient, ineffective. I really yeah. need to, 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 to work with other people. And then I thought, wait a second, Giorgio already has a group together. And, oh, no, no, I remember I called <laughs> you and I said, hey, you got, you, you set up, uh, you know, uh, a nonprofit, like how do you do that? You know, because I was thinking of setting one up, and then realized it's quite complicated and everything. And and I thought, you know what, Floriani's mission is almost identical to my own. Why set up a separate organization and compete with Floriani to try to achieve the same thing when maybe we right. could just work together? Let's work together. And then I, you know, texted you and I was like, hey, what do you think about merging? It's a great idea. Yeah. And then, yeah. And to be frank, uh, we were we were we were having kind of similar discussions at the time, um, and you were actually the first one to present the idea out loud, um, and that's where we thought it was a great idea. Obviously, yeah. so um, yeah, I think I think you're right when you when you're starting an, an organization like this, and especially a nonprofit. There's so many different. Um, there's a lot of different hats to wear. Um, Often, uh, being the director, a lot of those hats can fall on you. Um, but the more you can divvy them out and empower your team, uh, the better off you are. And so, for example, you're you're going to be leading the online teaching portion for uh, Floriani, mm-hmm. and that's something we just don't have the time to do. Uh, our group is often we're going to different locations, we're performing, and we're giving workshops, mm-hmm. and we just don't have the time to <laughs> be running things online. Yeah. I barely have time to respond to emails. 
I know how that is. But then there's then you know the other side of the nonprofit is the fundraising, development, yeah. um, content I'm producing. Good at doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get better. <laughs> um, Marketing and social media is like. Uh, yeah, I mean the the this whole. I'm not very good at that. Gregorian chant, as I said, is a, it's a completely foreign animal to our culture. Yeah. And um, trying to market a foreign animal, yeah. undervalued, underappreciated, and, yeah. and foreign and strange, and our culture doesn't understand that Gregorian chant is the is the foundation of all Western music. Yeah. Um, it's the most ancient of all music, um, and we can't uh, we can't lose lose our previous identity. We have to bring it back, and so really a huge part of what we're going to be doing is uh, rebranding a very ancient thing and saying, this is, this is awesome. Yeah. Make, make chant great again. Yeah. Make chant great again. <laughs> um, it yeah. And now I'm down here with you guys in Phoenix and we are recording an album this week. Should we uh, do a little uh, uh, plug for our new album? Yeah. I don't know how secretive it is. If you want. Yeah. Um, yeah, so our our new album is going to be uh, called "The Chance of Deliverance." We've uh, our group has been consulting with several exorcists across the United States about music that exorcists find powerful during um, the ritual of exorcism. Um, a lot of exorcists actually play music in the background during an exorcism. Um, oftentimes, it's uh, it's Gregorian chant. Yeah, actually, it does have a profound impact in our sessions. Very often what we will do is uh, we'll play various chants in the background, but at a, at a certain stage when we're playing the different chants, we'll come across one that he that really does bother him and annoys him. And But then what we'll do is we'll play that over and over and over again. And we have found that that has um, a weakening effect on them. Um, and so personally, I've spoken to these exorcists and they're like, well, you should use this chant because um, demons hate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Um, and so we, we, I was going back and forth with them on this and getting their different ideas and their different input. And so our new album is going to host a lot of psalmody that comes from the actual ritual of exorcism. Uh, but it'll also include several hymns that, um, just apparently the demons, demons hate. Yeah. So one of them, just to give you a little foretaste is, uh, the Dies Irae which is the sequence for the, the Requiem Mass, but apparently demons can't can't stand it. <laughs> yeah, um, which is unfortunate that it's been removed from the from the new Mass. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an option in the new Mass. Is it? Kind, of, didn't, kind didn't of a discouraged that. option. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, yeah it doesn't have a, a real uh, liturgical place yeah. in the new rite anymore, um, as it does in the old rite. Uh, but you can, you have the option added in. All right. Well, I know you got to run to some meetings. So yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thanks for uh, coming on the show. Yeah, this is going to be great. Yeah. This will be the first episode or yeah. one of the first. Yeah, okay. One of the first great. anyway. So. All right. Well, great. Thank you. Follow us at floriani.org. Um, we also have Spotify and Apple. Uh, we're on Instagram. Apple Podcast as the Chance School Podcast. Uh, this will be on YouTube. Yep. And Flori Flor Flor Floriani um, also has a YouTube page and also Instagram. They're more, more active on Instagram. We're getting so, better at YouTube, though. Yeah. So, and I'm the opposite. I'm mostly on YouTube. I have Instagram, but I'm not very active on there. All right. <laughs> All right well, thank you. Great. Enjoy All right. You. God bless, Chris.